2005, I was a 15-year-old growing up in southwestern Virginia. I've spent most of my life in the woods. I still love to be in nature. It's where I believe I have a stronger relationship with my creator. I was sitting under some pines overlooking a deer trail on a cold morning. My uncle had a deer stand in an old tree in the same spot, and he'd killed a few deer from there. Because of that and the cold front that had come through the night before, I had a feeling something was going to happen. As I sat there with my old side hammer muzzleloader loaded and ready for any deer to walk by, I heard the distinct sound of something crunching through the leaves. I put my rifle to my shoulder in anticipation of the deer I knew was about to pop up over the hill. What came over the hill wasn't a deer. It was a man who looked to be in his 40s. Right away, I noticed he was wearing clothes that weren't from this era. He had on a flat brim leather hat with metal buttons on the front for decoration. His coat was made with the fur turned to the inside, and his pants were the same with worn leather on the outside. His shoes were harsh sole moccasins, and he carried a leather possibles bag, the bag muzzleloader hunters carry with everything they need inside. It was across one shoulder with a powder horn on his opposite shoulder. His rifle was longer than the Hawkins-style rifle I had. His hair was coarse and brown. His bright blue eyes sized me up from a face covered in a full graying beard. It was as if he had stepped through the mist from a distant past. He had a look of confusion on his face as he approached, but asked in a congenial voice if I had seen anything yet. Perplexed by the fact that someone was hunting the farm that I knew I had sold permission to hunt, I managed only a curt, no. He took another minute to look me up and down, and I did the same to him. Can I see your gun? he asked. I handed it over and he passed his to me. He sat down and we each inspected each other's weapon with awe. Although his gun was longer than mine, it was lighter. More impressive to me than the gun was the man's appearance. I was amazed that someone was hunting in full mountain man apparel. Nothing he wore could have been as warm as my modern-day insulated clothing. It was a sight I never would have expected to see here in the Blue Ridge Mountains, but I thought he must be a man who wished to live in a different time and this was his way of coming as close to that as possible. Still, I couldn't help but wonder at his reaction to me. Maybe he really was from a different time. He handed back our guns, and he smiled at me as he stood up. I might have asked him a few questions, but at that moment, we both heard the sound of a deer walking. He's coming, the man said. Without another word, the man got behind me, and we both watched as a buck came over the hill. The man put his hand on my shoulder, and he told me to take a deep breath and squeeze the trigger. I did as I was told. Pop! It wasn't the boom of the rifle, just the pop of the percussion cap and the powder igniting. It was enough to send the buck running. The man's hand was still on my shoulder as I turned around to say something. The words died on my lips, though, as I looked around for him. He wasn't there. I could still feel his hand on my shoulder, but he just wasn't there. I jumped up, and as I did so, the weight of his hand fell away. I decided it was time for me to call it a day. I was confused and frightened, but I didn't feel he meant me any harm, so there was no need to run. I just walked home, reliving those moments in my head, wondering who he could have been or where he might have come from. When I got home, I put another percussion cap in the gun and fired. This time, the rifle operated properly. I cleaned my gun and put it away. I never got the man's name, nor did I ever figure out where or when he may have come from, and I've never seen him again. I'm 30 now, and I haven't hunted that area since. Sometimes I think about going back just to see if he might be there. 
There are some old rock walls in that area said to be from the 1800s, though no one knows what they were for or who built them. I like to think they were his once. The Bigfoot that wasn't. As long as I can remember, I've been a hunting fanatic. I've spent many days in the field with my buddies in pursuit of the wild and woolly beasts. Mostly deer and elk and occasionally bear in the Rocky Mountains of Utah, Wyoming, Idaho, and Montana. My friends and I would spend many fall nights and we would sit around a crackling fire in the high valleys of the mountains, weaving tales of hunts gone by. Each story told would seem to top the one previously recited. Some were new adventures, while others were old ones revisited every year, but with new, slightly enhanced details. As the night passed and the stories progressed, they inevitably morphed into tales of mysterious and unknown, like ghosts, goblins, and Bigfoot. None of us had actually seen a ghost, a goblin, or a Bigfoot. In fact, none of us had ever even heard of anyone encountering any of them, especially a Bigfoot, anywhere near the areas where we hunted. But for some unknown reason, each of us had experienced strange happenings that we were sure could be directly attributed to Bigfoot. I don't know how we knew they were connected to Bigfoot, Nevertheless, we were darn sure, convincingly so, when telling our tales of intrigue, that Bigfoot was the culprit. I guess one could say that we were embellishing the truth slightly, maybe even a little more than slightly. But it was all in fun, and everyone had a great time trying to outdo everyone else. Due to the convincing manner by which some could relate their stories, the lines between truth and fiction often blurred in the minds of the recipients, making it difficult to decipher between the two. This resulted in doubt and sometimes confusion in each of our minds about what really lurked in the shadows of the forests we hunted. One particular warm autumn day when the air was clean, fresh, and filled with the fragrance of sage, and the sky was clear blue and the golden aspen leaves shimmered as a slight breeze blew and rattled them around, I leaned against a stout but thin chalky white aspen tree trunk intently scanning the grove for movement, hoping to spot a sly old moss-backed buck as my hunting buddies pushed from the opposite direction. Just when boredom and daydreams started to creep into my mind, Larry, my hunting buddy, came thundering down the hill from right to left. His pants were partially down, one hand holding them up and the other hanging onto a roll of toilet paper that unraveled as he passed, trailing behind an apparent white flag of surrender. Sasquatch, he screamed. Larry was the kind of young buck that fancied himself a tall, tough, cigar-smoking, beer-drinking, four-by-four driving lumberjack of a man that could fell a tree with one swing of his axe. I started to laugh at the sight of such a man nearly streaking past as he half-mooned Mother Nature, while I wondered what had rattled him. At that exact moment, however, a heart-stopping roar erupted from just over the ridge top, 20 yards to my right and slightly behind me. I jolted to attention, darn near snapping my neck, while trying to orient my head to see what could have made the startling noise, all the while trying not to move my body and reveal my stealthy position. In hindsight, I suppose Larry, having just blown by me with all the stealth of a fire truck on its way to a four-alarm fire, probably negated that need. That roar was nothing like anything I'd heard in the forest before, and it scared the crap out of me. The top of a young aspen tree, about seven feet tall, rooted just on the other side of the ridge top, shook like it had been hit by a truck. A deep moan followed and a second roar or agonizing growl erupted. Holy smokes, what the heck is that, I thought, as I turned to face the unidentified creature. Another sapling, a six or seven footer just over the ridge from me, rocked and fell like it had been run over by a bulldozer. Whatever the heck this thing was, it was big and powerful, and from the sound of it, it was upset. 
My mind raced, trying to categorize the sound into something familiar, but nothing fit. Needless to say, by this time, I was more than a little concerned for my safety, as my only defense was a 50-pound recurve bow. Not ideal for toe-to-toe, in-your-face confrontation with, what was Larry screaming? A Sasquatch? But there weren't any Sasquatch in this area of the country, I reasoned. Was Sasquatch even real? By this time, the unidentified creature had just crested the top of the ridge 20 yards from me, but I still could not see it through the younger tree growth. Do I run or stand my ground, I asked myself. My curiosity wrestled with my common sense, and I couldn't quite decide until I knew what was confronting me. I crouched and stretched, peering and peeking through the trees, just catching glimpses, trying to get a better look at what was coming at me. A moan, and a growl, and a roar in sequence. One part of me screamed, run! The other part said, find out what this is, and then run! Another tree bent over, and then snapped back into place. It was like in all the stories you hear around the campfire at night. It looked huge. It was black. It was covered in fur and on all fours. There was still not enough visible yet to make any kind of identification. By this time, I had no time to run. This thing, this big, black, hairy thing, was almost on top of me. I had dilly-dallied too long, and all I could do was thump it with an arrow as soon as I could get confirmation of identification in a clear-shot corridor. I drew my bow, and I took a deep breath, and I let it out halfway. Tunnel vision was in full effect and I could only see what I was looking directly at in front of me. A circus elephant could have walked right up beside me and even sat on me. I wouldn't have noticed it until I was as flat as a pancake. Sweat was rolling down my brow and stinging my eyes. My arms were shaking with fatigue with my bow at full draw. The seconds turned into hours. I needed to release my draw, rest my arm for a moment, and wipe the sweat from my eyes. And quickly I did so. And just as I again drew my bow, the creature emerged through the thick underbrush into full view. I expected to see a Sasquatch. And for just a second, I did. But my mind was playing tricks on me. It was not a Sasquatch or a bear. It was a huge 1,000-pound bull, as in bovine bull. I released the tension on my bow slowly, and I took a deep breath. The bull walked painfully past me, moaning and groaning and growling as he took each step. His wide horns would push saplings down as he passed by, and they would either break off or snap back into place. I looked for the source of his pain, and I quickly discovered its cause. The bull's testicles were inflamed and swollen to the size of a small watermelon. Every time he took a step forward, his rear leg would contact the inflamed portion of his male anatomy and make him groan and roar with pain. The roar he made did not in any way sound like a bovine, at least none that I had ever heard. Of course, I was no expert on the sounds such an animal made when in extreme pain. He was such a massive bull that he had a very deep, raspy groan and roar that sounded like nothing else I had ever heard. His hair was long, shaggy, and tangled with sticks and tree leaves and mud. He looked old and fatigued and almost lost. He could have been blind. I was relieved it wasn't a Sasquatch and that I wasn't going to be torn limb from limb. I began to laugh and almost cry at the same time. When I emerged from the tree line, I met a rancher in an old rundown GMC pickup truck making his way up the dusty dirt road. He was looking for his bull. He had not seen it for a while and was concerned that it had been taken by predators or had died of old age. I told him if he just waited a few minutes right where we were, and if it didn't deviate from its downhill course, they would be reunited shortly. The rancher was relieved to hear his bull was still alive and close. 
He used a CB radio to call his sons in another truck to come and get the distressed animal. That night, back at camp, Larry took a brutal onslaught of jeers and laughters as I recited the encounter. This ended up being one of those stories told around the campfire every year. Larry didn't laugh about it the first few years, but eventually he found the humor in it and laughed right along with the rest of us about the Sasquatch that wasn't. This email is from Alan. Many years ago, we moved into what was technically called the last house on the left at the end of a long road. Although this has nothing to do with the story, when we moved in, previous tenants warned us that odd things would happen there. Well, we didn't believe them at first, but our disbelief was short-lived. It began with my four-year-old daughter screaming at something she had seen in the living room. She said it was a black cloud that had crossed the room and disappeared into a corner. At the time, we dismissed it, but a few days later, when my wife's sister came for a visit, she watched in horror as that same black cloud reappeared from the same corner and enveloped her two little girls. Later that same day, my wife saw that same cloud come from the corner and wrap itself around her. She described it as suffocating. It was hot and smelling of sulfur and burning meat. The cloud seemed to manifest itself around only women and girls. Fortunately for my sons, that did not mean that males were spared from the haunting. The house was built into the side of a hill with the front door on the west, and it opened onto the second floor where the living room and dining room and kitchen and bathroom were. The door on the east side of the house opened onto the first floor where the bedrooms and laundry room were located. The front door always squeaked loudly and no amount of WD-40 graphite or silicone gel would make it quiet. One night, the boys, aged eight and six, heard the front door open, so they went to investigate. In the open front door, they saw an odd green mist, and when they approached the door to see from where the glow was originating, it vanished. My younger son was the one who discovered the specter's aversion to pleasant smells. My wife would set out store-bought air fresheners, but this was useless. Once the room was vacated, the fresheners would be closed. My younger son pointed this out, as well as the fact that the scented candles we used would extinguish themselves when the room was empty. My older boy was beset with his own terror. Frequently, he would awaken in his bottom bunk to find a horrific, contorted face shrieking at him. It was an aged and wrinkled face of uncertain gender. He would also learn to put away his toys. One night, he was roused from his sleep by the sound of his toys moving around on the floor. He opened his eyes to see a small black being moving his trucks, warships, and cars against the door, as if to barricade it from entry. As soon as they realized he was watching them, they turned and began climbing the covers, trying to get at him. He screamed, and I came running to find him clinging to the bottom boards of his brother's upper bunk. Until now, I had seen nothing, so I was still somewhat skeptical of all these stories, but that was about to change. We were asleep downstairs and I was dreaming. In my dream, I walked into our bedroom, but there was no bedroom furniture there. It was furnished as a living room and on the sofa sat the most beautiful red-headed woman I had ever seen. My wife, beautiful in her own right, was a brunette, but in this dream, I knew the redhead was my wife. She was crying. She turned and looked at me through blackened, tear-filled, frightened eyes. I should have felt pity for this woman, but I felt only rage. She cowered into an arm of the sofa, and I started toward her to continue the beating I knew she deserved. I heard a voice and realized that the dream had been silent up to that point. Somehow I knew this was because my wife was deaf. The voice had come from my six-year-old. I turned and saw my real-life son standing in the doorway wearing clothes I had never seen before. He was wearing black pants and a long sleeve red pullover. 
He was soaking wet from head to toe and his skin was ashen and lifeless. And again, I felt no love for my family, only a burning rage. The boy looked up at me and said, Dad. He too had a look of abject fear in his eyes, but he continued, Dad, help me. I turned to him, and with an uncontrolled fury, I raised my fist and struck the child square in the face. I sat up in bed, suddenly awake, and my wife was awake beside me, screaming, What the hell was that? I realized that there was a fight going on in the living room above my head. Two men were yelling at each other, throwing around furniture and breaking glass. I jumped from my bed and ran upstairs. And as my foot fell on the carpeted hallway of the second story, it went silent. No one was there. The windows were intact. The furniture was upright. Nothing was out of place. But the door stood open, shrouded in an iridescent green glow. I walked over and looked out onto the darkened street. There was nothing. Everything was quiet. Fallen autumn leaves swirled in the cool night's breeze. And I returned to my wife and climbed into bed and waited with her in silence for the dawn. And dawn did come. And as it happened, it was October the 31st. I stood on my front porch drinking my coffee and trying to rationalize my dream. And then I heard it. A chill locked my spine as I heard my six-year-old son say, Dad? Afraid, I turned and looked down the hill to where my son was crouched down doing something. Dad, help me, he said. I approached to see that he was using a stick to try to dig something out of the ground. It was a strip of black corduroy. I bent down to help him, but pulled him away when I saw a flash of yellowed bone and I grabbed him and ran into the house. The police came and dug up the remains of a little boy. He was six when he died, and he was wearing black corduroy pants and a long sleeve red pullover shirt. My brother is now a detective with the local police department, and although they have a lengthy file on the boy's father, they remain unable to locate him or his beautiful, deaf, red-headed wife. Oh, what a story. (laughs) What an awesome story. I I normally don't comment on these stories after I read them on the What If It's True podcast. But, oh, God, that was a great story. Thank you for sending it, sir. Okay, this is a good email. It's kind of a long story, but it's good. The writer says, my Bigfoot encounter happened on Saturday night, July 24th, 2016 on the edge of Yosemite National Park Wilderness camping area. Be careful when camping in California. Bigfoots are there, even though California Rangers say, no, it must have been a bear. But trust me, it was no bear, and that's fact. My name is Steve, and I'm 59 years old. Now, I've lived in the golden state of California my whole life. I have always hunted since I was young and I lived in the city at the same time. My family had connections to the Central Valley of California and Dad liked hunting ducks and pheasants mostly. So that's how a city boy in California turned out to be an outdoor guy who ends up owning an outfitting business in Afton, Wyoming while living in Silicon Valley in the early days and I'm still here, unfortunately. Six years ago, while working on my home, I had a bad head trauma accident, and I ended up in the ICU for six weeks. Before the accident, I had an active life with little time to do much but what was at hand. So now I find myself house-ridden for two years with nothing to do but lay on my bed for hours having nightmares about scary thoughts. Due to the accident, I have bad PTSD. I get up every night between 1.30 and 3.30, needing something to keep my mind busy from negative thoughts or other things that I can't remember or pronounce. Each night, I get on my iPad searching for Bigfoot, and my mind would be safe for hours. During the long hours of reading and watching every video I could find, I started to learn and realize these folks had no idea what they were doing chasing these creatures. So I took my knowledge of hunting in years of outfitting and I started studying how to get one. 
The recovery from my operations was taking longer than I thought, so I was getting frustrated, and I decided to get out of the house and go hunting for Bigfoot. I knew that these creatures were living supposedly in my state. It's just there's a lot of woods in California, so I needed some locations to start. During my early morning studies, I read about a nationally known Bigfoot organization, and that is where I started. I contacted them and got set up to go on a trip in Northern California. The lead on the trip contacted us and wanted to talk about what would take place. There was no guarantee of seeing anything due to the creatures being very secretive and elusive. I told him I did not leave my home much due to the above issues, so I wasn't going to be able to go alone, and I was looking to go with another person. My wife is my caregiver and was not interested in chasing these so-called Bigfoot animals around at night with strangers. Well, I had time on my side, so I started asking all my family members. None were interested in my crazy adventure idea. They thought my mind might be slipping further, but it wasn't. No one believed in these animals, and they were not going to waste valuable time searching it out with me. And then I went outside the family and finally convinced a young man named Conrad, who my wife and I had mentored for years, and we love and trust him. Conrad hadn't camped ever before in his life and was looking forward to camping, but did not really think much of Bigfoot. So I was excited that I had a trip for these elusive animals, and now I would get them figured out in no time. Yeah, right, I would get them figured out. Conrad and I received the email where all of us folks were to meet up for our Bigfoot research trip. We all got to the state park camping area that we were going to call home for the next four days. While setting up our gear, we started talking with others from the group. Conrad and I couldn't believe how many of these strangers were just normal folks seeming to be helpful to everyone. I figured that we might be in for some real crackpots chasing these creatures, and I was prepared for anything. So everything was good to this point, and we were starting to relax and mingle. And during the first night sitting around the campfire, we discovered that we liked the same TV shows, same books, magazines, and so the days went by fast. On the last night, we had driven up to a dry, dusty fire road to park trucks and then climb to the top of a mountain. This all took place in the pitch dark. When we were at the top, we were to sit and listen. We made calls and we made tree knocks to try to drum up something to respond, but everything was quiet. We spent most of the time looking at the stars and sitting on warmed rocks from the day's sun and relaxing. We spent all that time listening for any responses to our calls or knocks. Well, after a few hours, the lead person informed the group that we should head back to the trucks because we were going to meet up with another group, and we talked with them about what we should do next. It was 2.30 a.m., and most were tired from the past four nights of hiking and with limited sleep. We all came up with a plan, and we started to go our different ways back to camp. I decided to go back the same way that I came up. I knew I had some good looks at some meadows when the light of the truck would brighten them up, and I could see everything in those fields. The lead person asked us to drive slowly to keep dust down for a better viewing from the truck. I asked if any of the folks wanted to come with us since I had room for three and were going straight back to camp. Conrad and I were leaving when three ladies decided to join us for the trip back. We started down the steep rocky slope. There was thick brush and grass on either side and it scratched the sides of the truck as I rolled. We were all talking about how much we had enjoyed the trip and were exchanging phone numbers so that we could keep in touch. And halfway down the bumpy road, Conrad started screaming, There's a Bigfoot! He was pointing at a big red-eyed creature standing 40 feet in front of our truck behind some shrubs off to the right side. Well, I looked at this creature and it was standing there just staring at us. I wasn't running or even walking. It just stared at us with big red eyes the size of limes set inside sockets of a huge head. It moved to the right. I could see shoulders in the side of its head. 
and I stopped the truck, and at that moment, all three of the ladies who were sitting in the back started screaming because they saw this thing and they were ready to leave. I was seeing something I really was not sure existed and I wasn't ready to leave yet. So I slammed my hand down on the dash and I said, we're here to see this thing and there it is and I'm not leaving. It wasn't doing anything but standing there. And then it moved a little to the right and my eyes were locked on it. I wanted to open the door and get a better look, but I was trapped in the tiny road with bushes on either side and no space to get out. I wanted to get a better view when it started to move out of the headlights. The head was enormous and it was all covered in dark hair or fur of some sort. It moved further right into the bushes and small trees, but it was too dark for a picture or a video, so I just wanted to see it if I could get my flare on it and then follow it into the forest. Unfortunately, the flare was in the back of the truck and I was in a tight spot on the road. And at that moment, I was not thinking of how or what to do. I just kept my eyes on it as long as I could. All this time, I was completely scared beyond my limits. And I was wondering if at any second, I might start to have a medical situation, which would make my body shake uncontrollably and my mind begin to scramble. Maybe the situation was too much for me to continue functioning due to my injuries. Well, that's why I brought Conrad so that he could get me back to camp in the event that this happened. I had no idea how he would react if this situation were to take place. I figured out quickly as I asked Conrad to lower his window to help me figure out where this thing was, when he quickly responded by yelling, Hell no, I'm not rolling my window down. Well, I remained calm so the others would not be more scared than they already were. I wanted to get out of the truck. But then I wondered if they would drive away in a panic and leave me there. But I started to get out anyway. I was halfway out of my truck and I was jammed between the door and the bushes. And I couldn't keep my eyes on it at the same time while moving to the back of the truck through the bushes where the flare was located. I slowly pushed through the bushes back to the truck tailgate and I reached in with one hand while watching and listening for movement. And I could hear this thing moving around, but didn't know exactly where it was. It seemed to be moving a little further away because the branch breaking seemed to get more faint. The thought that maybe there were two or more creatures concerned me, though. Maybe this one was distracting us while another moved in. And in addition, I never caught wind of a foul smell. Your mind messes with you at times like this, and this situation was going by much too fast and scary for my body to keep up. That's when I noticed that this fear was different from any other fear I'd ever felt in my life. It seemed to envelop my whole body, like if you were to ski the whole day and get cold and then walk in a warm house where the heat hits you in a rush. It was a very weird sense of fear, almost like I was in a bubble. I finally got the flare out of the truck and started looking down the small hill where the creature was before I lost sight of it, and I couldn't see it anymore, and I wasn't hearing any movement. Meanwhile, the others in the truck were radioing the group on what was happening and asked for them to come help us. Once the others started to arrive, my fear went away as we talked about what had just taken place. I couldn't really say what had happened. Maybe I was in mild shock. But I'm glad I saw it with five other people instead of seeing it by myself. Now that makes us all crazy, not just me. We got back to the main camp and talked more on what had taken place, cracking up on how no one else would even roll the window down to assist me. We were on a Bigfoot research trip and we actually saw one. And we lost all thoughts of what we should have done. And it still makes me laugh. Conrad and I were so amped up that we couldn't sleep, so we stayed up until the morning sitting near the fire. Both of us were still trying to understand what we had seen. It took me two weeks to settle on the realization that we had actually seen a Sasquatch. Well, the next morning we packed up camp and we left for home where I hoped I could get some sleep. We both talked the whole way home about why our government has not been honest on this subject. 
At no point did I ever think of shooting it. I had carried an ACP pistol ready to use on my hip, but I never reached for it. I suppose I would have had the fear not been so overwhelming. In addition, it makes sense to me why there have been so many sightings and virtually no good images taken. I believe it's the fear and shock of actually seeing something like this. I mean, we were on a Bigfoot trip and had everything we needed in the truck, and everyone was too scared to even think about taking a picture. If we did take a picture, it would have been a big black blurry blob like many others. You're caught so off guard when you get lucky enough to see one, and the last thing you're thinking about is grabbing a camera. My only thought throughout the whole ordeal, even though it may have seemed brave that I got out of the truck, was, is there enough distance between me and this monster that I can get away if I need to? I have been out many times since this encounter, and I've been out of California and have had many different types of interactions with these creatures, but I've never had another visual. I've hunted Alaska, Canada, and all over North America. I've harvested many large game animals and many at long distances. These Bigfoot can be taken with a properly placed shot. However, standing 40 feet from this creature, I'm not the one who could have ever gotten the shot off that would have needed to take it down. The fear would not have allowed me to have been steady enough to hit the target. I shoot 50 yards offhand with pistols all the time at metal targets the size of a soda can, and I'm a good shot. I would not have had a chance at 40 feet with a head bigger than a Home Depot five-gallon bucket. If someone can control the fear and properly place a good shot to the head, it will go down quickly in my opinion. But if you miss, you could be in for a bad day. There's more to these creatures than we all know yet. They kind of incapacitate someone with fear from doing and thinking straight. Some say it's infrasound. I think maybe we should just stay tuned until the creature allows us more insight on what is going on with them. Keep up the great work, Cam, for entertaining us all. You're doing much more than you ever imagined when you started the storytelling gig. Not sure I'd still be investigating this incredible creature if I didn't find yours and other sites on the internet. And he signs off Steve. Steve, thanks for that last paragraph. And I don't know if I'm helping anybody, but I'm sure having fun telling your stories. That's that's the that's the hoot about this whole thing because uh, again, I love good stories. But this was uh, pretty awesome. This guy was uh, I'm assuming he's disabled. And, but he's able to get out and hike and move around and drive and go camping. And he goes on a Bigfoot excursion, and I, they actually see one. It's like he said, I'm not leaving. We came here to see a Bigfoot, and there's one right out there. I'm not leaving. And I kind of don't blame him. I think I would be that way, too. And the thing about the pictures, I don't know what the deal is about the pictures, but Steve's explanation makes more sense than any of them. When you see one of these things... You're so damn nervous that you can't think straight and you don't have enough poise about you to just grab a camera, calmly lift it up, take a couple of snapshots or a video. I can see that. I can see that because you're, you're, even if you're looking for them, you're not expecting to see one. Now I'm, I'm making assumptions here, but that's what I think it would be like because I've never seen anything like a Bigfoot ever. But this was a great story, and this is the end of the podcast. And thank you all so much for joining me on this podcast, and we'll see you on the next one. Thank you.